ladies and gentlemen, next guest is Bartosz Wieczorek and the lecture is Cyber Big Data Migration from OnePrem to Google Cloud. Welcome. Hello guys, uh, welcome everybody to my talk. Um, I'm Bartosz Wieczorek, Principal Software Engineer at Sabre or a Data Science Engineer. Um, so I have like so 16 years of experience in Java. I'm actively coding in Java and other languages. Um, and six years of experience in big data. Uh, I'm from Sabre, so a couple of words about Sabre as well. So Sabre is a technology company. Uh, it's a global company um, doing software for travel business. Uh, we have our uh, stand on this conference in, um, in the hall. Uh, there is a Java quiz, so you can win some cool stuff, including Nintendo and others. Um, we have lots of openings for all uh, Java um, levels, including contributor, senior, lead, even principal level. Uh, yeah, we are located in Krakow, uh, but it's a global company. Um, yep, let's get started. Uh, as Sabre is in uh, mm, travel uh, industry, I will try to keep this um, presentation as, as a journey. Um, I will present real um, project called Air Shopping Migration from on-premise, so Sabre uh, own data center into Google Cloud. I will present the use case architectural goal and explain how the architecture uh, change once we learn more um, about the cloud. Uh, what's highlighted here, it's important that it's uh, for big data area for distributed um, ETL processing. So what is big data? It's not only about high throughput, high TPS. Um, it's not only about big data volume, uh, like uh, terabytes of data uh, per day. Uh, it's also that we have like 30 data sets. Um, we, we process um, different types of uh, messages like XML, JSON, Edifacts, uh, CSV files. We process them from uh, Sabre internal systems. Uh, we have like uh, frequently changing uh, data, transactional data, and we have some uh, more or less static data, for example, uh, geo data. Uh, we use distributed uh, technology to process all the data. Uh, so the term here, ETL, is extract transform load technology. Um, so we, we probably could do all the processing in a one big powerful machine, but think of a use case when there is a big spike in the traffic, uh, which that machine couldn't handle, or what really happened also during COVID pandemic is that uh, uh, the processing resources went down and that machine, one single machine, won't be underutilized. So that's why we want to use more um, uh, smaller machines to effectively scale up and down. Um, what will be also in the agenda, I will present our uh, technology and uh, the rationale for choosing those. Um, I will discuss also the optimization we did in the in the Java code, uh, or the user code. Uh, I will discuss the optimization in the configuration of the tools we've been using, uh, what were the issues and what how we solved them, how the architecture has uh, evolved, and hopefully, uh, you know, some people say that you learn most from the failures, so hopefully by this presentation um, I will save some of your time and stressful situation uh, and you get a little bit prepared for those or, uh, or try to avoid them. So let's maybe, let's start with a quiz. So uh, how many, who of you actually has written the code uh, that it's already in production on the cloud? Okay. 
maybe 20 people. Um, how many of or who of you actually didn't have any issues, did not have any issues with the services that the cloud providers uh, are offering? Uh, three people. That's good. Uh, <laughs> I would say, I know Michal, but uh, maybe I should change the company and go where there are no issues. Um, okay. Um, so what's, what's our use case, uh, air shopping? So when you are searching for, uh, for the flights, um, you probably specify some parameters where you want to fly, uh, when, um, so all these requests, these are, uh, we call them shopping requests. Uh, in the response, we'll get lots of itineraries with the prices. Uh, so that's our use case, that's our project. Um, so the Sabre system on your left uh, uh, has the shopping forwarder that asynchronously forwards all the messages uh, from the uh, shopping system into um, on-premise Kafka. Uh, so Kafka is a buffer in that case. Uh, and in on-premise old architecture, we had a database uh, hive where we uh, stored the processed um, payloads uh, from the shopping forwarder. So we wanted to, to eventually store them on GCP in BigQuery here. And uh, as we know, the shopping forwarder would eventually migrate from on-premise to GCP we would need to have a buffer in uh, cloud pops up to, to store these messages uh, once yeah, shopping forwarder is on GCP. So when you see ETL, one, two, three places, we would need to choose the right technology to serve our architecture goal. Uh, there is some heavy transformation in the second ETL. Um, that ETL for sure, um, in the top, it was uh, used on the daily basis uh, to do some uh, machine learning. Uh, eventually, we write data to uh, shopping tables and to custom views where we want to restrict uh, access to the data at the table and column level. So particular users would only request access to, let's say, uh, Saber internal fields or some sensitive fields only when they have a specific use case. And all the data would be exposed for another ETL, for BigQuery queries, for I platform. Um, what would be the use case, for example, when we want to do the um, some uh, machine learning um, operation. For example, um, if there are cu customers who are interested based on historical data, how changing the price uh, up and down can uh, increase their revenue, that's possible while uh, doing, while analyzing historical data, uh, training the model uh, um, and running um, predictions or classification. Um, or Another use case, if you're searching for the flight and uh, you send lots of requests, uh, what should we return back in the, in the flight responses so that the Sabre system is not so much overloaded, but the clients actually get what he or she wants uh, um, as a first response so we can propose them some personalized uh, um, responses, so they can what they uh, th they will get what they want faster, and uh, you know that will increase satisfaction on the customer side, and also you know um, uh, the profits on the uh, on the service travel service provider side. So Saber is is kind uh, joins. It's a glue between service providers, the travel service providers, and the customers. So the more bookings, the more um, um, ancillaries we sell, of course, uh, the more uh, travel agencies learn, uh, earn and also Sabre gets more profit. Um, 
So this is an example of the XML, so the payload that we use, we have inner shopping. That only shows the response part. What's key thing is that this XML is a eight level nested XML. Some of the elements in the array, uh, in the sub elements in the XML are also arrays, so not uh, simple records. Uh, some of the parts of the XML reference the other part of XML, and uh, I will show in the, maybe on the uh, diagram which I uh, skipped, what's the input uh, throughput. So we receive like 60, from 60 to 100 FAT messages. What, what I mean FAT, these are gzip messages. Uh, they are com uh, compressed, they are highly nested XML. Each each message uh, after decompression is about 30 megabytes. Um, and think of uh, the payload as appended up to 100 XMLs inside uh, the content. Um, so daily we process like in that project specifically more than 10 terabytes of uh, compressed XMLs and we will end up uh, with um, 500 uh, millions of BigQuery rows. Uh, what's important to know is that FAT messages has many records inside, as I mentioned, like concatenated XML. So, so there is a, a fun out one too many. Uh, that will uh, that's important for uh, understanding how we kind of reach the final architecture and what uh, decisions we need to make. So what was our um, evaluation candidates for ETL, so um, distributed processing. We had some experience with Spark since we on-premise written um, uh, many jobs on Spark. Uh, they were running on Hadoop cluster um, uh, uh, with, Clou on with Cloudera manager. Um, and we could actually run uh, some of those uh, in Spark on the Google Cloud. Uh, uh, starting Spark on um, Cloud Data Proc, and they offer, and Cloud Data Proc is like, think of a, a, a cluster that it's serverless where you can, a big data cluster. Um, and the alternative was Apache Beam um, uh, to be run on a Google uh, Cloud Data Flow. And right now I will explain which technology we chose and why for our use case. So a little bit of uh, um, explanation about what Apache Beam is. It's used for batch and streaming data processing. What's a batch? If you have um, a bounded um, collection of data, so you know in advance what is your data. So for example, you have files on GCS. Uh, you specify a particular uh, location on GCS you can process it in a batch mode. Uh, and what is streaming? Continuously flowing set of data. Uh, so like a Twitter clicks or our in-case uh, requests and responses. Um, Apache um, Beam um, has uh, many connectors. So does uh, Apache Spark. Um, Apache uh, Beam can be run on multiple runners. Um, one of them is direct runner, which we I can run Spark, I can run uh, Beam uh, on my laptop. That's also possible for Apache Spark. Um, uh, we uh, we were testing Apache Beam on Cloud Dataflow as a runner that has the option of auto scaling up and down. Uh, not I, I don't think that all the runners have this option. Um, and the code for Apache Beam, uh, it's, level ag it's language agnostic, so you can write that um, in Java or in Python, and I will explain when to use either of those. Um, so how does the ETL look like? I don't know I'm not sure if the people from the last row see that, but general concept of the ETL processing, you read it from uh, some source, like uh, PubSub, uh, GCS, uh, you then transform your data and you write it back to the destination. And what's in between, it's so-called 
uh, parallel collection, so a distributed um, collection. So there are many nodes um, doing the processing, and each of the node has some portion of the data. Uh, so sometimes the data needs to be uh, shuffled or moved between the nodes, especially we, when we do the um, uh, grouping or when the uh, connectors do the grouping. Um, so why did we choose um, Apache Beam, and not Apache Spark? Even though we had uh, some good experience on Spark, but we decided to to go for the Beam. Uh, our use case, uh, of course, this is a simple example, but sometimes I believe showing something simple also helps to understand, especially if uh, audience is new to, to big data. Um, so this is the g pipeline graph from GCP data flow, um, where you receive payloads. This is, you read it. Uh, right now I create this as a part of a JUnit test. There is some dispatching happening and based on some um, criteria, we will write it either to, to the one branch or to the other. Or in our production, we will write to a uh, failure table in BigQuery or a success failure in BigQuery. So um, uh, let's have a look into the Spark code in the bottom first. So we create a distributed collection with uh, strings one, two, and three. There is a map function uh, that will be run on each uh, worker um, you know, uh, at the same time. Uh, and I'm logging that I'm processing one particular string. Uh, and at the end of the uh, code, I'm writing either to the branch even or odd. And at the time when we were evaluating Spark for that, actually our code was either to, uh, in order to write to the branch, we either needed to reread the, um, uh, the data from our source. Uh, so that means the processing time, uh, the processing uh, um, entry will be logged six times, one, two, three, for writing to event branch, and one, two, three, for writing to the odd branch. To prevent rereading the source, we needed to cache, actually. So all the, all the collection by Spark uh, that we read would need to be loaded into memory, and if memory is not enough, some of the collection would be stored on the disk, which is not very efficient. So I'm not sure if it's still the case for Spark 3. I haven't found, uh, I haven't found any uh, solution to that branching option in Spark 3 yet. Maybe I didn't search deep enough, but that was very important for us. And another factor is that uh, it's possible to deploy um, application, um, uh, Spark application in the cloud um, data proc, but uh, uh, only batch version of the Spark is supported by the Google Data Proc, uh, not the streaming. And I understand because streaming has always issues, and I will explain all lots of issues about streaming. Uh, um, and for Apache Beam, you can you will de uh, declare uh, a tag, which in that case can be an event tag and a dispatch method you will write your business logic where what kind of elements you want to be dispatched to the event tag and at the end of the day you will get from the tagged collection the specific tag you are interested in and you will write it to the uh, to your destination so apache beam supports that um so, as I mentioned in Apache Beam, we could write our code in, in Java or in Python. Um, I'm a Java guy, so I first started with Java, written many, many jobs in Java. Uh, but uh, even though it's Java conference, I still wanted to take care of the Python guys. So I wrote it the same pipeline also in Python. Um, in Java, it's a matter of uh, declaring some Maven dependency for either direct runner or um, cloud data flow runner uh, and make them as runtime dependency. And in Python, 
you would uh, use pip install to install the right dependency. Um, when will I use Java? I'm a Java guy, so probably most of the time, especially when, in our case, we use heavy XML processing, where we use Java-only dependency, like VTD XML Java dependency. But if I wanted to do some interactive session with the audience um, to teach how Apache Beam Spark works, I would use interactive runner in a Jupyter Notebook where I can, in each uh, cell, I can uh, type uh, the processing command. And in each, uh, after each uh, cell, I could collect or um, show what's my output collection after each of the processing recipe. So here uh, it shows the, the output, hello, GDD conference. Another use case, uh, some people say, and I agree, uh, Python is um, more concise. So you can see the mm, uh, pipe operator is for Java apply. Uh, and I uh, cannot remember, is it error shift operator um, to overload uh, the name of the step that you can see here, that it shows create or lock. So definitely more concise, uh, but I would I would more focus on the libraries, uh, and I'm haven't run the test uh, for the same heavy processing pipeline in Python or in Java. Uh, if Python can do the same processing as fast as possible in Java on the data flow environment, uh, that needs to be checked. Um, so when running Apache Beam on the Google, Flow, Google Cloud infrastructure, we needed to choose Dataflow Runner. And what's, once, what's important is it scales up and down. Um, how do you control the resources usage or how do you control um, um, the, yeah, the resources you, uh, in uh, Apache, in the data flow runner, you specify the machine type. So do you want to use N2 standard for machines or do you want to use high mem machines? Um, what's important is the ratio between number of uh, virtual cores and the memory um, for these cores. So if the tra processing is more memory consuming, we would go for a high mem option. Um, how Apache Beam is auto-scaling? It's based on the uh, CPU, so if the machines are underutilized, it will scale down or over it will scale up only if, and also the second condition needs to be met, so the upstream source backlog. What it means? If you're processing and even if your machine are underutilized, but, you, but your source is declaring, hey, we are receiving more and more data, uh, then it wouldn't scale down. So these two factors need to happen. Uh, the backlog needs to decrease and there has to be low CPU in order to scale down. And the opposite for the um, uh, yeah, scale up for both of them to be fulfilled. Um, it's, well slim, it's well integrated with GCP monitoring uh, dashboards and alerting, but you know, uh, I will not show that today because uh, I believe that all the content would be like a for one day session. Um, what's it's running using Google Compute Engine with the Apache Beam image, uh, and it offers um, a useful feature called uh, classic and flex templates. So actually, we use that when. Uh, uh, we use it a lot for our deployment. So for each environment, like a third dev and prod, we build a template, uh, so like a graph for um, uh, for the job execution, and we can start the job from the template, providing some runtime parameters. So the same pipe, the same template on dev third and prod, but on prod two hundred workers on dev two, um, uh, on prod. Uh, uh, e uh, high mem machine eight and on uh, dev uh, so like on prod 64 gig gigabytes of memory and on dev 
four gigabytes it's enough for memory. Okay. Um, so once we've chosen uh, the data flow, we can say our architecture looked like let's use cloud data flow streaming for reading from Kafka. This is the first on the left. Uh, if um, then what uh, to read from Kafka and write it to PubSub. Uh, then the second pipeline, the second ETL, Cloud Data Flow, a shopping transformation, which does this heavy XML processing. Uh, it's also the streaming pipeline. I will explain what the duplication and event time is in a second. Um, and the machine learning batch job would be a batch since it requires one day of data uh, to classify uh, the records, whether they were done by human or robotic systems. So, and we were hoping that would be our final architecture, but it wasn't. Um, I will explain a couple of features uh, of the data flow just for the sake of understanding what issues we had uh, uh, for the data flow. Um, and what options uh, it has. So one of them is um, uh, message the duplication. So there is no guarantee in the PubSub that uh, once data flow reads messages from PubSub, you will not get duplicates. So the downstream um, clients of a PubSub needs to deduplicate the messages on their own. So here is the simple uh, scenario, what, uh, how I can test if the, the duplication really works on data flow. Uh, in the second uh, black um, square, there is a snippet of the code that creates a PubSub message, uh, sets some body, and put um, um, an attribute value into specific attribute. And the first two payloads, uh, in yellow, payload number one and number two has exactly the same value. Payload number three and four has exactly the same value, and so on. So if there was no deduplication, we would get 600 elements from uh, um, uh, written by data flow. But uh, when we apply the message deduplication using with ID attribute, which is on the first um, oh, maybe that works. Oh, no, it doesn't. Um, with ID attribute and we specify the attribute name, data flow needs to kind of remember in memory for the last five or ten minutes, remember what were the uh, payload, um, this specific message uh, attribute and the duplicate. So eventually we will store in the destination only 300 of those, and we will get the graph that actually duplicates did happen. I hope that it's clear for everybody. So the duplication based on some uh, PubSub message uh, attribute that we can define by ourselves. Another uh, important feature uh, in distributed processing is so-called data freshness. So Whenever a source uh, publishes uh, the data, it assigns a timestamp when the, this event was created. Uh, and mm, that timestamp is used to track how fresh is your data. So let's say if the source team has created uh, an, uh, um, an event a minute ago uh, and you proce proce process it right now, you will see data freshness at, at one minute. If there was a outage of the man in the middle for one day, the source has created the data yesterday, and now we are processing it, you will see the data freshness to be one day. Uh, so in the example in yellow, uh, I'm sending uh, the payloads with artificial so uh, event time, so an attribute of a message, to be just the same all the time, uh, so that event time sent by the source is constant. You will see on the left uh, this diagram that the data freshness will increase up to 10 minutes. So because 
you know, the time passes while we process the messages, but the event time is always the same. That's why it increases. It's artificial situation to demonstrate what the data freshness is, but the, the normal case is when we don't interfere with event time and uh, and use it um, um, so that it increases over the time, you can see the data freshness is around uh, uh, 40 seconds. Uh, well, it's around 10 seconds in the first uh, part of the green uh, graph when there is traffic. And it's 40 seconds when there is no traffic because Apache Beam or a data flow has this discoded feature uh, not really much documented is that when there is no traffic, there is conservative um, watermark set explicitly to 40 seconds. So that's why if there is no data, you will see a little bit higher freshness. freshness. So how to know if your streaming pipeline is performing well? One of the options is to check the data freshness. Data freshness should not exceed like a couple of minutes. Uh, but don't expect it will always be below a minute, especially if there are some, um, if there is no traffic. Okay, uh, uh, a little bit of beam advantages um, compared to Spark. Again, we've got more fine grain, uh, fine grain control um, when we want to write an event. So we process the event, and we need to make a decision: should we just uh, write each event immediately, usually it's not the case, uh, and, or should we buffer the events? Uh, how long should we buffer these events? Um, should we like um, rely on the state uh, of processing messages? Okay, there are messages for that timestamp with particular window have been already processes, processed, so we can advance the watermark. Um, and Beam will do all the magic for us, or we can explicitly tell Beam, and we can see in the in this in this code that we either want to wait uh, two minutes, uh, or and when there are no records uh, in this two, where well, let's say if we're waiting, we can either output every two minutes or. If there are uh, at least two elements, we can output faster. And we can join this condition um, together, either this or that. Um, in uh, Apache Spark, uh, there was no such a fine-grained control. Uh, Beam also allows to define strategy how to deal with late data. Um, and. Uh, it's yeah maybe that, that explaining the late data requires a separate session so that's why I will only focus that there are many connectors uh, available and some of them written by by Google as well especially when it comes to uh, Google um, uh, infrastructure but some of them are Kafka uh, some of them are Fileio JDBC so many many connectors uh, it's possible to write your own uh, sources and things. Uh, one of the things to remember writing them, you need to kind of tell Beam how is your backlog, how many messages left you have to uh, process so it knows how to scale up and down. Um, and I will show uh, at the end of the day, at the end of the presentation, one example of a BigQuery I.O. connector, which I believe is one of the most complex. So I will show you the pipeline graph, how it looks like. Um, user code optimization. Uh, this is a comparison of the old approach that we did on the left and the simple code and the code change on the right. Uh, and let me explain what it really does. So two things from this slide. One that you can test your business logic, like uh, decompression using a uh, direct runner building, running the local pipeline on your computer. Uh, so that's always recommended, especially for Python, uh, to make sure uh, uh, everything works and you don't get surprises uh, because of its dynamic nature. Um, 
And what was the case? When we were processing a FAT message in the process method, and this is the bytes for the FAT message, we could first unzip the message. And once we get this 30 max payload, we would then iterate through these 30 max and emit each XML for the further processing. But that would consume much more memory compared to the second use case or the second or the solution that we implemented. We use gzip input stream and on the fly it will read some portion of the stream, chunk it into pieces and immediately emit. So not to wait until we decompress everything, so emit fast. We want to, in distributed processing where are a lot of messages, we need to emit fast to progress the pipeline. Uh, the result is the same, the difference is in performance and resource usage. Um, lots of content here, uh, uh, the concepts here. We were running out of memory how to solve that problem. Uh, we, in order to solve the problem, there has to be some knowledge about how Beam or data flow works internally. What's important in the slides is that um, the parallel distributed processing happens on many nodes, on many workers. Each, workers, each worker is a Java process and, it's, uh, and it has multiple threads. Um, each thread processes a chunk of data. Um, and what I, what I mean by chunk is that it, it processes the data in bundles. So it doesn't like take one element and, and write it to the disk, take another element and write it to disk. Instead of what it does, it, it groups the data uh, into bundles before proceeding to the next step. And how to learn from that and check if it's really true. There, uh, Apache Beam allows us to uh, annotate some method to uh, be informed when the bundle actually gets created um, and check the bundle size as it increases and log the data when the bundle finishes. And what it's really shown here that we have two workers with the IP uh, 32 and IP 31, and there are different thread IDs um, starting the bundle. So yes, each worker have different threads, and, uh, and each thread accumulates the data be before writing. And that was OK for the batch job, when the number of threads for each worker was equal to logical number of cores, so 16 uh, cores on this Mac. Um, but if we use the streaming job, the default number of uh, threads is 300. So imagine you receive your XML and each thread will take a bundle of XMLs and keep them, uh, keep it in memory. So 300 times a bundle size, it will blow out of memory. And this is what happened. So what was the solution for that problem? Um, we needed to limit the number of threads, even though Google does not recommend that, because usually what Google recommends to use streaming for small, tiny messages. When the processing is really fast, there is little uh, memory consumption uh, for each message. That was not our case. So uh, this um, processing of a data flow, let me get back to one of the architecture slides. And that air shopping transformation processing was a heavy XML processing, lots of memory being involved. So that solution did not work. We spent like, uh, months load testing that, checking 20 switches in data flow. And the one of the solution was to limit the number of harness threads. So instead of 300, use 32. Uh, we could increase the memory first before re re um, changing the number of workers harness, but then it will still uh, throw out of memory because it will fill up the memory a little bit later, but still fill up. Okay. I think I need to finish in five minutes maximum. Um, 
What was our problem with the streaming job? Draining. So what is draining? Draining is a stopping, gracefully strop, stopping a pipeline. Uh, and, and it doesn't always work like this, that it stops immediately. What happens if we, um, if we don't drain the job and it was our production case? We start a new pipeline because we want to like, release a new version of the pipeline. We drain the old one and look, the new one is not writing to GCS. What is the problem? Everything is okay, traffic is flowing, data flow is accumulating all the data into memory, but we don't see in the output any messages. Wow, okay. So what we really did, we needed to, in order to new pipeline to progress and write put, we needed to cancel the, the old one. What's the problem with canceling? We are losing records because gracefully we could, we could, when we do the draining, data flow will stop accepting new messages and try to, whatever it's being progressed, finish that and flush. But once we finish, once we uh, cancel the job, immediately um, uh, kill operation is sent to data flow and uh, we lost the messages. So we did lose messages, but we have no choice. We needed to cancel the job so the new one progresses so that the data freshness will not be ours. Uh, uh, in the very beginning of our journey, we didn't, we, we first um, were draining and waiting until the pipeline finishes, and then we were starting the new one. There is this option of a skip wait on termination, so the new job will be asynchronously uh, started in parallel once the second one is draining. Uh, by using this flag. And this is, this is first running, then it gets into draining, the second one immediately starts, and uh, the, the second one is running, and the, 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 the first one is drained. Uh, this is how the BigQuery I.O. component pipeline graph looks like. It's very complicated, uh, uh, so <laughs> not easy to debug that. Um, this is on the, uh, in this black rectangle, you can see how uh, we can configure that declaratively. Um, and we were actually, after all these streaming problems, we decided go to go with the batch approach for the last pipeline. And how is the autoscaling working for the batch pipeline using file loads? It processes all the elements by writing them to GCS. This is what the BigQuery I.O. component does and uses the BigQuery load jobs to load them from GCS into BigQuery. And it uses a single worker, so you can see in the graph like uh, one worker being clocked. What's the problem if that writing to GCS, oh well, right loading to BigQuery, is what's the one of the root causes? B uh, the, the pipeline uses BigQuery default slot pool that it's shared for all the jobs across the project. And there is no way to monitor that. So we don't really know what is the slot usage. The more, wor the more jobs we deploy, the slower they get. What's the option? By explicitly um, reserved slot just for loading these uh, payloads into BigQuery or create a new project, which will be the extra you know, management cost to create multiple projects for uh, data flow processing. Um, so how does our architecture look like right now? The first two components, the first component, Kafka 2 pops up. Since we were having fat messages, we needed to first decompress it, chuck it into smaller pieces, so split and compress, and then send it to pops up. So uh, that was required to scale up above 50 TPS of fat, fat messages. We were using the, uh, the duplication and event time in case of a failure of a down upstream system. Um, that uh, our shopping transform, is a, it has been converted from streaming to the batch that's being scheduled by a composer every 30 minutes. Uh, we don't have such a ma such a SLA that we need to be ready with all the data in a couple of minutes. One hour is enough, so we could afford that. The alternative solution, instead of a batch load, 
was to use streaming um, uh, BigQuery storage write API, where, where we could do that in a streaming fashion, not to go for the batch approach, but for our use case, it would be a huge, huge cost compared um, to the batch approach. Um, and we use the, the batch approach for the robotic shopping calculation. Uh, so this is the summary of the problems that, the, that we had, uh, which I probably covered already. Draining, if draining drakes for level, we need to cancel so the second pipeline, the new one, can write. Uh, but the problem with cancelling is that we use messages, so we need to uh, use so-called pops-up retention functionality to um, even the data flow has um, taken the messages from pops up and even a cloneage that to pops up hey I, I have I, I'm in the middle of processing your messages you can uh, you can treat this message as, as being taken care of uh, by uh, data flow this retention allow us to seek back to the uh, place uh, when the outage or a problem happened and run these messages again but then we will can end up in BigQuery with duplicates, so we will need to apply the duplication. Auto scaling based on memory usage. We had out of memory what Google suggests. Don't use just simple data flow. If you cannot optimize it to your use case, use extra paid data flow prime that, that allows um, memory auto scaling because the default data flow doesn't allow uh, auto scaling, it's only CPU auto scaling. Um, when there is big fan out, need to split in advance. Um, when there is a problem with writing to BigQuery using file loads, you need to have a separate project or buy additional slot just for this loading. Um, the data flow uh, code runner is not public. There are some internal switches that Google support team knows best. And they are sometimes they are helpful. Um, this is the uh, technology stack that we use. Uh, I think I covered that. We use Terraform for NRflow for uh, processing. These are, this is my blog uh, and uh, GitHub repository that I use to experiment on the technology and the solutions. And uh, the, the key message, uh, we are happy what we have. We are happy uh, with the support that we receive from Google team, but don't expect that everything will work in the cloud from the day one and you won't get any issues. The actually, you will learn, learn based on the failures, which, which happened to me as well. So, but I still think that's a great journey uh, that we went and hope you will benefit from that. Maybe not, maybe not data flow, but at least in the concept of distributed processing and the challenges that it has. Thank you. Thank you very much.